Welcome once again to Leto's Law. Here's Steve Leto. This video is going to be lengthy, and for that I apologize, but it's an extremely important topic, and the story is extremely important. And as you might guess, it starts with the Institute for Justice. And I've mentioned them before, they do great work. They often step in on cases where other people would not. And here they are helping out a donut shop, a donut shop. The story's been all over the news. I've gotten this story sent to me by lots of people. Thank you very much. And uh, I decided to go directly to the pleadings, the pleadings. So they have filed a lawsuit on behalf of the donut shop. And they also filed a motion uh, for a restraining order, an injunction. And what's going on here is there is a small town donut shop that uh, has above the shop's front a, a mural, a big open space. And some high school students uh, were invited to paint a mural on this space. And they painted uh, an imagination of mountains, of mountains and, and donuts. And it's a beautiful mural. Uh, it does not contain any wording or verbiage. And the local town has come by and said, you must take that down because it violates our zoning regarding signs, signs. And people pointed out and said, well, wait, the town's got murals all over the place. What about the murals? And the town said, well, no, it's a sign because it's commercial in nature, because it's attached to a business and you guys sell donuts. If it was something else or it was just the mountains but no donuts, we'd allow it. That would be a mural. But this is a sign. <laughs> and so that distinction, calling it a sign versus a mural, is an odd one, which actually doesn't work. But this is a First Amendment issue. So when the people at the Institute for Justice caught wind of this, they stepped in and said, you know something, we'll help this person, the owner of the shop. So it's Sean Young, not the actress, it's a guy, Sean Young, Forever Young Bakeries and Forever Young Properties versus the town of Conway, New Hampshire. So this is all happening in New Hampshire, a town called Conway. And I'm going to go through the pleadings. It's actually a 16-page document, but I'm going to summarize it and also just use the important stuff because there are some technical issues that don't really matter to our discussion here. But this is a First Amendment challenge to a municipal sign regulation that unconstitutionally has the town of Conway acting as a censor and discriminating against speech on the basis of what is being said and who is saying it. That is the extremely important thing to be looking at here. Because if you regulate speech, by the way, some speech can be regulated. We've talked about this before. Many things that you have rights to do can still be regulated as long as the regulations are reasonable and make sense and are good for, you know, they're for a good purpose. And there's all kinds of analysis that goes into that. So just the fact that there is regulation is not the problem. It's that the regulation governs what is being said and who is saying it. Because it turns out that if someone else had a sign that had donuts on it, they'd be okay. So there you go. It's a First Amendment case. The motion here and the lawsuit involve saving a mural installed on the facade of Levitt's in June of 2022. The name of the shop is Levitt's. The mural was designed and painted by local high school art students. And it features sunbeams shining down on a mountain landscape made entirely of baked goods. And trust me, it sounds like heaven on earth. Right now, wherever Homer Simpson is, he's making that sound he makes. Despite the mural's popularity, the town of Conway declared it a sign because it depicts the products being sold inside the building it is attached to. So as a result of that, the plaintiffs here risk criminal charges and the prospect of hundreds of dollars in fines for every day the mural stays up. Therefore, they're asking for injunctive relief. The First Amendment does not permit the town to force Sean to choose between censorship and ruinous fines or criminal charges. As the Supreme Court makes clear in its precedence, the town's actions against Levitt's mural constitute unconstitutional content-based and speaker-based restrictions on speech. What is being said and who is saying it? Content-based and speaker-based restrictions on speech. Those restrictions are subjected to strict scrutiny by reviewing courts. And so they talk about what level of scrutiny a court must give a statute to determine whether or not it's constitutional. 
And some statutes uh, can get by uh, with a lower uh, inspection by the court. But strict scrutiny means the court's really going to look at it and determine whether it's absolutely necessary to protect some interest that the, that the municipality's got uh, to, to protect. And here, that's not going to happen. Now, we don't have a ruling yet on this. So I'm simply reading to you from the pleadings that were filed a couple of days ago. But uh, you want to start taking bets? <laughs> so they've asked the court to issue a temporary restraining order, a TRO, in order to protect the mural until this matter gets resolved. So underlying the whole story, for over 45 years, there's been a business called Levitt's Country Bakery. Uh, the Levitt's founders retired, and this new guy bought it because he heard there were rumors that someone else might buy it, turn it into a gas station or a parking lot, heaven forbid. So he bought it to keep it going. And so it is still the bakery. It has been for years and so while he had taken it over, um, he met these students and gave them complete artistic freedom to design and paint the mural themselves. Guys, gals, knock yourselves out, as I like to say. The result was an homage to the White Mountains with a whimsical twist befitting the beloved bakery. And there is an image of this built into the uh, pleadings that were filed. And it is a mural uh, over the top of the entrance of the shop, uh, and it is simply a painting. It does not say Levitt's Bakery. doesn't say Eat Donuts. It, it doesn't say anything. It's, it's, it's an image. It's an image. And interestingly, due to the building's angle, the mural does not even squarely face the road and is not easily seen by all passing traffic. So you got to go out of your way to actually see this thing. And they've attached screen grabs from Google Street View showing that that is in fact the case. So the sign is only visible to people coming from one direction or people who go out of their way to see it. So somewhere along the line, the town's code enforcer visited Levitz and his visit was not prompted by a complaint. Nobody complained. Rather, he saw the mural in the news and took it upon himself to drop in and check it out. And he then told the owner of the business that the sign, the mural, uh, was actually not a mural, but it was a sign. And it was subjected, therefore, to the sign code. They have a, a code regarding signs. And the sign code talks about how big the thing is that is attached to your business and what it does. But you'll discover the sign code is actually something that is so vague that it can be interpreted very strangely and has led to some very weird results, even in this little town. So the code imposes strict size limitations on signs. For instance, uh, one section applies to the commercial district in which Levitz is located, and functionally identical regulations apply to signs located in other non-residential zoning districts. For instance, a wall sign. For lots without multiple commercial tenants, each lot shall be permitted one wall sign. The height of the message area shall not exceed the greater of 20 feet from the undisturbed ground or a height equal to 75% of the total height of the building, nor shall it exceed the height of the wall to which it is attached. The message area of the wall sign shall be based on the following formulas, etc., etc. Notice it says the message area. What is the message of an image with no words? That's one problem, but there are others. So in the letter that the man who owns the business received from the sign police, um, the letter said that the square footage of the bakery is 1,300 square feet and that per the formula, he's allowed a wall sign of only 22 square feet. But of course, the mural is 91 square feet, so that makes it you know, roughly four times the size that is allowed by, by the sign laws, the sign laws. So <laughs> town officials stated that Levitt's mural is a sign because, and this came from a, a hearing, because it depicts yummy goodies. And that's a quote, yummy goodies. And that if Levitt's painted over the baked goods with pictures of things not sold inside, it would be a mural that could stay up as of right. So if it didn't display donuts and baked goods, it's okay. He could have it displaying all kinds of wacky stuff. It could display cars. It could display animals. Um, it could dis I'm, and, and I have to be careful here because I have a bunch of stuff popping into my head that it could display that would probably get this video tagged by YouTube. And, and so there you have to ask yourself, wait a second. 
is there any actual reason <laughs> that I could put up a gigantic mural of zoo animals, but I can't put up a mural of donuts? So you have to ask yourself about that. But let's talk about some examples. Town officials have enforced the sign code this way for years. In 2006, the town enforced its code against an ice cream parlor that had installed ice cream cone-shaped trash cans. They put these ice cream cone-shaped trash cans outside the store, and town officials determined that the can's primary purpose was to sell ice cream. They're not for people to put trash in? You think that the trash cans sell ice cream more then they accept trash. Okay, I'm not sure how you'd measure that, but apparently that's what they believed. Interestingly, in 2009, the town enforced its code against a farm stand mural of a field being plowed because the image depicted farming and the stand sold farm products. Now, next door to Levitt's, I believe, is a farm or some kind of farmland. Following the logic of the town, if Levitz wanted to, he could put up above his store a huge mural of farm products. The farm next door could put up a huge mural of donuts. The farm doesn't sell donuts, that's okay. Levitz doesn't sell farm products, that's okay. Perfectly okay. Two signs right next to each other. The moment you switch the signs, violation of the municipal code. So again, when you look at a rule and you're asking yourself, was that rule, that law, that statute, whatever it is, make any sense? You've got to ask yourself about things like that. And why would that make sense? Because you're driving down the road and you see two signs, donuts and farm goods. One order, perfectly legal. The other order, illegal. On both counts, by the way. <laughs> so, town has a long history of not enforcing its sign code against exterior displays it considers murals. There is a shopping center in Conway, which is home to many murals. Among them is one with the message, Welcome to North Conway, and one depicting the story of New Hampshire heritage, and one depicting giant butterfly wings adorned with purses, sunglasses, and presumably other things that you can buy in a store. And as we all know, butterflies don't wear sunglasses. So that mural would appear to be a sign. But no one bothered to enforce that for quite some time. So that changed, however, in December of 2022, when the town declared for the first time that the three settlers' green murals were actually signs. Uh, and those recent actions seem to have arisen due to the controversy over the Levitt's mural. So when somebody said, well, you're, you're picking on this guy about his donut mural, why aren't you picking on them about their sunglass and purse mural? They said, oh, I guess we'd better go pick on them then. And that's not the point. <laughs> If what they're doing is okay, what he's doing is probably okay also. The town's decision to enforce its sign code is based on the painting's message and who put it up, rather than any threat the painting poses to public health or safety. So, for instance, approximately 30 feet from Levitt's entrance, access from the same parking area, is a farm stand that faces the road. The man here asked officials if the town would consider the Levitt's mural to be a sign if its content remained the same, but were instead displayed on the farm stand. Town officials told him that if Levitt's painting were displayed on the farm stand, the town would consider it to be a mural, not a sign, because the farm stand doesn't sell baked goods. So he could put his mural over there, and then they could put a mural over here, and they'd all be okay. And people would pull into the parking lot, and he'd have to go, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Farm goods over there, and the other guy has to go donuts over there. But people would figure that out, okay? So it's just silly. So they applied for uh, a temporary restraining order and injunction because they're being threatened with action. And uh, there's a, obviously a lawsuit that's been filed now. And so as they go to court, it, pretty much everybody's looked at this as, look, the, the donut shop's going to win. It's a question whether they win in the first court, second court, or if it goes all the way to the Supreme Court. Uh, the question also is how much fight does the town want to put up? So when you apply for a TRO, a temporary restraining order, that's the one you can get pretty quickly. But you then have to have a hearing about turning it into a permanent injunction, which would then last during the lawsuit. And you have to show, among other things, that, that there's irreparable harm that you're facing, along with 
uh, a, long, uh, a strong likelihood of success in the merits. And so obviously the fact that the man's facing potential daily fines, okay, that's serious. But also, uh, is he going to win on the constitutional side of this? And, and it looks like he's got a very good case because a law is content-based if it distinguishes between permissible and impermissible speech based on the topic discussed or the idea or message expressed. Under this test, it is irrelevant whether the law is adopted for benign motives or censorial motives, censoring. Uh, An innocuous justification cannot transform a facially content-based law into one that is content neutral. The only thing that matters is whether the government allows some types of content while disallowing others. Second, a law is content-based if it was adopted for content-based reasons. Under this test, the government's motive is paramount. Even a facially content-neutral law be deemed content-based and subject to strict scrutiny if the evidence indicates it was adopted for the purpose of suppressing speech. As explained below, Conway's discriminatory treatment of murals the town deems related to the businesses displaying such murals is facially content and speaker-based. And because Conway's regulations turn entirely on who is doing the speaking and what is being said, government must demonstrate that its mural restrictions satisfy strict scrutiny, which it cannot. And so then they go into a whole discussion about what strict scrutiny means. Talk about content-based regulations, where there's a law that says people can speak here, but they can only say certain things. And so... Whether content-based in execution or in purpose are subject to strict scrutiny as are speaker-based regulations. Under strict scrutiny, restrictions on speech are presumptively invalid. Moreover, the burden of satisfying strict scrutiny falls on the government. They've got to prove it. The, the, the burden of proof is on the government to prove that their law actually makes sense. Um, government must prove that its restrictions are justified by a compelling government interest, and are narrowly drawn to serve that interest. It is rare that a regulation restricting speech because of its content will ever be permissible. And that's a court speaking there, the U.S. Supreme Court. Those infrequent cases in which the government meets this burden involve weighty issues such as preventing terrorism or preserving judicial integrity. So unless you think that high school made mural of donuts is going to cause some level of insurrection. (laughs) You're going to have a hard time convincing anybody that it's a danger to society. So they go on and discuss a whole bunch of other stuff, but they end by saying this court should, one, obviously grant the TRO. Number two, grant an injunction when that time comes. And part of granting an injunction is if somebody is ordered to stop doing something or not do something, uh, the courts can actually order the party asking for the relief to post a bond if what they're asking for could harm somebody, should they lose. And as the Institute for Justice points out here, is that if they lose this, uh, well, then the sign comes down. And, and the city doesn't get hurt. The sign's been up for quite some time now. So they asked the court to set a bond at $0 or a nominal sum, like a dollar or something. Uh, But it turns out the court may set the bond in whatever amount it finds proper and may set the bond at a nominal amount or even at $0 if there is no risk of financial harm to the enjoined party, which here would be the city that we're talking about. So for the reasons set forth above, this court should grant the motion for temporary restraining order, set the required bond at $0, and this case will then proceed on to trial uh, if it gets that far, or if the city uh, does the right thing. It's a town, a town of Conway, New Hampshire. They could just go, you know something, we've consulted with our attorneys, we've taken a look at this, and we've decided that our sign regulations are actually a little bit out of whack, and we need to do something about this. So it boils down to, and, and again, I, I, I bring you back to that example I gave, that there's a building with a mural on it, a painting, okay? So let's not use mural or sign. Let's just call it a painting, okay? Painting doesn't contain any language, doesn't say shop at Joe's, doesn't say, you know, fine food, doesn't say eat our donuts. Literally no wording on the sign. It's a painting of donuts, okay? Stylized painting of donuts. And let's assume that the guy next door sells farm goods, 
and puts up a mural of the exact same size with all of his farm goods on it. So it's got corn and it's got squash and it's got zucchini and it's got pumpkins, just images of these things with no verbiage, okay? If this painting over here is a sign because it has farm goods on it and this painting here is a sign because it's got donuts on it and you literally take them and just switch them, move them 20 feet each way. Now the farm goods are over the store and the donuts are in the field. Perfectly legal. Perfectly legal. <laughs> Which shows you the signs don't hurt anybody. The murals don't hurt anybody. The paintings don't hurt anybody. And nobody bothered to complain about the butterfly with the sunglasses and the purse. And yet, when you look at that, you could say, well, hey, that's just a stylized painting of a butterfly with sunglasses and a purse. Yeah, attached to a building that sells those kinds of things. And so it becomes obvious to most people who look at this that it's simply a matter of there is a law on the books that's written so vaguely that they can make you remove your garbage cans because they think your garbage cans are signs. And they said that that was based on the shape of the garbage cans. So you've got a statute that's that vague being used to enforce a law that can lead to such nonsensical results as simply moving the signs, like I said, and getting a different result. So it's a constitutional issue, First Amendment, and it looks to me like the Institute for Justice is on the right side of this one. So we'll wait and see what happens. And so obviously the town could say, you know, something we've changed our mind, we'll rewrite our code and we'll let it stay. Or they could say, no, we're taking this all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. We'll see what happens. But the Institute for Justice is in for the long haul. <laughs> that's what I like. Those, that's why I like those people so much. So I've mentioned before, I love the Institute for Justice. Uh, and check them out. I'll put a link to their site in the description below the video. Uh, if you are so inclined to support them, please consider it. They're a 501c3, so anything you donate to them is deductible. Talk to your accountant. Uh, unfortunately, Amazon canceled the Smile program where you used to be able to do that with your purchases. You can't anymore. And someone sent me a note and said, hey, Steve, some employers will actually match your uh, giving to nonprofits. Uh, some employers will have a program like that. And if you have such a program, consider doing that with the Institute as well. So again, I, I just love those people at the Institute for Justice because something like this, the reason this law is still on the books is that the other people who've been affected by it didn't have the wherewithal or the, 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 the money or think about the fact that they could fight this and win. And so it takes somebody like the Institute for Justice to step in and say, okay, we'll take this and, and, and fight this however is necessary uh, as a matter of principle. And that's what they're doing here. So it's a great case, Sean Young, Forever Young, and Forever Young Properties versus the town of Conway. But it's the donut mural case, the donut mural case. And I will follow this and let you know what happens. Thanks to everybody who sent it. Questions and comments, put them below. Those. We'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Thank you for watching Leto's Law. Darkness cannot drive out darkness. Only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate. Only love can do that.